Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight, 1964, will play prominently in the cast, but before we talk about that, we're going to talk about Georges Langer, who died recently at the age of 108. Georges Langer was a French resistance fighter during World War II. He was born Jewish. He was the cousin of Marcel Marceau, who helped Jewish children escape the Nazis, but Georges looked Aryan, and he too managed to help hundreds of Jewish children escape to safety over the Swiss border from France during World War II. He was a physical education teacher and he taught Jewish children who were living with Catholic families in South France how to run and how to play soccer and he would get them near the border where they'd be secreted over onto the safe Swiss side. He took other children across hiding them during funerals and then having them climb trees in the cemetery to safety on the other side of the border. Here's the BBC to talk about Georges Langer. A man credited with saving the lives of around 350 Jewish children during the Second World War has died at the age of 108. Georges Langer would take the children to play football on a pitch near the border with neutral Switzerland. That's where they would slip through an unguarded fence to safety. The resistance hero was later awarded the French Military Cross and the Holocaust Memorial Foundation described him as an exceptional man. Extraordinary story, that. Amazing story, and a man well worth remembering. He's definitely a man worth remembering. Just as a point of information, by the end of the war, Jewish deportees from France to the murder camps in Eastern Europe totaled over 75,000, with children making up 11,000 of the total. Only 2,800 French Jews survived the camps. From a Jewish population of 330,000 in 1940, Nearly 80,000 had been deported or murdered in France. They represented more than 24% of the Jewish community. So the hundreds of children that Georges Langer saved, and there are reports that it was more than the 350 that the BBC reported, represent a significant fraction of the Jewish population in France during World War II. We're going to move on now to Mel Stottlemyre, who died recently at the age of 77, one of the most important players in New York Yankee history. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. He was the best New York Yankee pitcher in the down decade they had from 1965 to 1975. As I said, 1964 is an important year in this cast, and it's an important year for Mel Stottlemyre. By 1964, the New York Yankee dynasty, which began in 1920 after they acquired Babe Ruth, was coming to an end. The Yankees had won 13 pennants in the previous 15 years and nine World Series, but by 1964 they were running on fumes. You could see hints of it in the 1963 World Series when Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale dominated them and the Yankees were swept in four games. Their two best players, Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle, were now on the downside of their careers. A lot of their other stars were replaced by younger players who weren't nearly as good. Guys like Phil Lins and Hector Lopez hardly murderers row, and their pitching was extremely thin. Still, in the summer of 1964, they were in a three-way race for the American League pennant with the Orioles and the White Sox. And I remember very well because I was a big White Sox fan. Because the Yankees were thin on pitching, it looked like their dynasty was just about over, and they wouldn't win the pennant when they called up a 21-year-old rookie in mid-August. In his first major league game, he was against the White Sox in a pressure-filled game, and he beat them. I remember that game thinking, who is this kid? And then the next week, he beat the Orioles in another critical series. He went on to win nine games, and that basically put the Yankees over the top. Think about that. A rookie called up in mid-August, winning nine games in less than two months. You talk about phenoms. Then in the World Series, because Whitey Ford was having arm trouble, Stottlemyre pitched three times in the series. Think about that, too. A rookie going three times in the World Series. The first time was against Bob Gibson, one of the greatest pitchers of his generation, and Stottlemyre beat him in the second game against an excellent Cardinals team. He pitched in the fifth game against Gibson again and gave up only one earned run. It was good enough to get the Yankees to extra innings, but they lost in the 10th when a reliever gave up a three-run home run to Tim McCarver, which was Tim McCarver's greatest baseball moment, by the way. Stottlemyre then pitched the seventh game on two days rest against Gibson again, but a rookie against Bob Gibson with two days rest in the seventh game of the World Series, he got beat there, and the Yankees lost. And that was the end for the Yankees for the next ten years. Still, Stottlemyre gave up only seven runs in that World Series, and it wasn't the end for him. He was one of the best pitchers in the American League for the next ten years. The problem is the Yankees overused used him. The farm system had run dry and they really didn't have much, so they overpitched him and burned out his arm. That probably denied him a Hall of Fame career because at his height, 
He was as good as almost any Yankee pitcher in history. However, he knew a lot about pitching, and he came back as a pitching coach. He was probably the best pitching coach of his generation. He helped the Mets win the World Series in 1986, so he did get a World Series ring there. Then he came back to the Yankees in the 90s under Joe Torre and helped them win four World Series, and that earned him a spot in Centerfield Monument Park at Yankee Stadium. Not many guys knew more about pitching than Mel Stottlemyre. Here's Major League Baseball on him and his career. Five-time All-Star, ace of the Yankees in the 1960s, and really a fantastic pitching coach. Five World Series rings. He was with that 1986 World Series champion Mets team, and then with the Yankees dynasty as well, and just made a huge impact on a number of pitchers. And Tom, I know you covered him for a long time and, and spoke to him and worked with him. What, what was Mel Stoudemire like to deal with? You couldn't come across a finer gentleman. He talked about his career, what he did as a pitching coach was extraordinary. There were four straight years with the Mets where they led the league on run average. He goes to the Yankees. They lead the American League in ERA in 97 and 98. He got things done no matter what kind of pitchers he had. You look at his pitchers, they stayed healthy. They had long careers. I remember he would catch bullpens. A pitching coach who would catch bullpens because he wanted to see from the home plate perspective how each pitcher's pitches were moving. But again, what stands out to me is, is what a classy guy, gentlemen. Everybody got along with Mel Stottlemyre. Famously, Joe Torre, who really didn't know Mel when they were both hired at the same time in New York. They were kind of hired separately. Turned out to be a great friendship, a great working relationship, obviously. And let's not forget, Scott, the career that Mel Stoudemire had, right? How good of a pitcher this guy was for bad Yankee teams, for the most part, other than he first came up at 64. I looked back, too, at his workload. Think about this. From age 23 to 31, he averaged 272 innings a year. <laughs> 2,400 innings from age 23 to 31. In the live ball era, the last 100 years... Only one American League pitcher had a higher workload in those years, 23 to 31. That was Jim Palmer, the Hall of Famer. This guy was a workhorse and an elite one who happened to be in the worst time in Yankee history, right? <laughs> that, that period there in the mid-60s, the Horace Clark era, was a great pitcher and probably would have had a Hall of Fame career, but rotator cuff stopped you. Back in the day, Val, you know, that would stop you. If something was wrong with your shoulder as a pitcher, there was no arthroscopic surgery. You were pretty much done and... That happened to him as a pitcher. He had a famous speech in 2015 in, in June uh, on Old Timers Day at Yankee Stadium. He received a, a plaque in Monument Park that day. I think timing-wise, not just being on that Yankees team that wasn't as successful at the time, but also timing-wise, like you said, maybe if he wasn't so overused, he would have had even more longevity as a pitcher, maybe even a Hall of Fame case yeah, at some point. That would make a great point. His sinker is known as one of the great sinkers of all time. I mean, you could not lift that ball back in the day. Anytime he had such a run on it. Career ERA below three. I mean, what a baseball life. He will be missed by by anybody who knew Mel, whether you knew him for a day or for a lifetime, you felt like he was your friend. Mel Stoudemire is one of those guys that because of what he did later in life, you forget how good he was as a player. Guys like Jerry West, the same way. Here's a little bit of his speech from that old timers game where he got his monument. Ladies and gentlemen, Mel Stoudemire. Well, this is beyond a doubt the biggest surprise I've ever had. Today in this stadium, there is no one that's happier to be here on this field than myself. If I never get to come to another old timers game, I will take these memories that I have today and I will start another baseball club coaching up there whenever they need me. Thank you very much. Well, we're gonna close with our feature and by way of introduction, there's this. Good evening, this is Carol Channing. Yes, that distinctive voice belonged to Carol Channing, who died recently at the age of 97. There's nobody like Carol Channing anymore. She was one of the most recognizable stars in the world, almost exclusively because of her Broadway career. I can't think of anybody like that today. And she, of course, created two of Broadway's most iconic roles. In 1949, in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, she was the original Lorelei Lee. If she'd never done anything else, she'd be a legend for that. But in 1964, that year we were talking about, she was an international sensation with her performance as one of the most historic characters in Broadway history. She was the original Dolly Levy in Hello, Dolly. There have been a lot of quite talented actresses who've done Hello, Dolly since then. But she was sui generis. You can't think of Hello, Dolly without thinking of her. And you can't think of her without thinking of Hello, Dolly. Carol Channing was born in Seattle, but she moved to San Francisco as a girl. She went to Lowell High School. That's the same high school that Pierre Salinger and Jerry Coleman went to. We did a Jerry Coleman podcast. 
She moved out east to pursue a theater career. She went to Bennington. She knocked around Broadway in the 40s. There was no indication she'd be any kind of star until author Anita Liu said, there's our Lorelei for the role of Lorelei Lee in the musical Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And she killed it. The reviews were great, the show was a smash, and she became a big star as the blonde gold digger. And of course, she did the signature number of the show. A kiss on the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. A kiss may be grand, but it won't pay the rental on your humble flat. Or help you at the automat. Men grow cold as girls grow old, and we all lose our charms in the end. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. She probably portrayed Lorelai as she was meant to be played, slightly calculating and cynical. But four years later, when the musical came to the screen, they wanted a sexy Lorelai Lee, and there was no one sexier at the time than that blonde whose career was just taking off Marilyn Monroe. Her Lorelai was memorable too, but it was sultry and sexy, not quite as well fleshed out as Carol Channing's. I'll refer you to our Jane Russell podcast for Marilyn Monroe's version of Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. Everybody has their favorite, but I gotta go with Carol Channing on this one. And it wouldn't be the last time that she created an iconic character and someone else took it over in the movies. We're going to flash forward to that year I spoke of, 1964. It's January. It's less than two months after the Kennedy assassination. It will take another month for the Beatles to perform on Ed Sullivan. And there's a snowstorm in New York City, and a new Broadway play is about to open. Here's Gary Moore and I've Got a Secret, which was a big television show at the time. Now it is time to meet our special guest for tonight. She mushed through the snow and the blizzard and the wind and the what all on foot, coming directly tonight from rehearsals for the Broadway musical in which she is starring. It's called Hello, Dolly. It opens later this week. Here, bless her heart, is Carol Channing. Oh, I made it. I see you've gotten here, too. Did everyone else make it through the storm? About one-eighth of the audience made it. The rest of them chickened out on us. Oh, we're this the Vikings. Now, uh, uh, Carol, in this show that you're doing, Hello, yes. Dolly, yes. you play the part of a matchmaker, yes, right? right? You are a lady who makes her living by introducing single girls to eligible men and tries to marry them all, That's right? That's right, Carol, yes. Sounds like fun. Oh, it is fun. I really enjoy it. Just another new musical opening on a wintry Broadway. Except unbeknownst to that I've Got a Secret audience, it became one of the biggest hits on Broadway ever and a cultural touchstone. In their first public appearance after JFK's funeral, Jackie Kennedy brought Caroline and John John to a matinee performance. Here's one indication of how big it was. The number Hello, Dolly! was covered in the spring of 1964 by Louis Armstrong. It's the only version that can compare credibly with Carol Channing's, and it knocked the Beatles off the number one spot at the height of the British invasion. And yet, once again, when the movie version was coming up a couple years later, she was overlooked for the new next thing, this case, Barbara Streisand. And this time she was really hurt by it. She didn't mind that much being replaced by Marilyn Monroe because Marilyn Monroe used to come to a bunch of performances and paid homage to her. But the Barbara Streisand thing cut her to the quick. And you can argue Marilyn Monroe versus Carol Channing as Lorelai Lee, but you can't argue Barbara Streisand versus Carol Channing as Dolly Levy. It's Carol Channing and it's not even close. After a couple thousand performances, she turned the role over to Pearl Bailey in an all-black version. Pearl Bailey was very good and a lot of great actresses have done it, but Carol Channing was, is, and will remain Dolly Levy and Hello Dolly. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. It's too bad, even if it's understandable, that she was usurped in her two great roles because Hollywood wants glamour and Marilyn Monroe and Barbara Streisand give them glamour. But neither of them gave the character to the roles that Carol Channing did. And she played Dolly all over the world, including before Lyndon Johnson after he won the presidential election in 1964. And she sang Hello Dolly as Hello Lyndon. So what else can we close with? As a tribute to Carol Channing, one of the most iconic numbers in Broadway history and, in fact, in American cultural history. There's no other excuse for my existence in the theater. Hello, well, hello, it's so nice to be back home where I belong. You're looking swell, baby. I can tell, Dad. You're still flowing, you're still flowing, you're still.
And people keep saying, what would you like on your tombstone? She lifted people's lives. That's what I want on my tombstone.